Chapter Two of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Two, A Lucis Naturae. The two men entered the house talking, Quarm lurching against his companion in his uneven progress, uneven partly because of his lame leg, partly because of his excitement, and when he wished to urge a point in his argument, he enforced it not only by raised tone of voice and cogency of reasoning, but also by impact of his shoulder against that of Pepperill. In the room into which they penetrated sat a girl in the bay window knitting. The window was wide and low, for the ceiling was low. It had many panes in it of a greenish hue. It commanded the broad firth of the river Tyne. The sun was now on the water, and the glittering water cast a sheen of golden green into the low room and into the face of the knitting girl. It illumined the ceiling, revealed all its cracks, its cobwebs, and flies. The brass candlesticks and skillets and copper coffee pots on the chimney piece shone in the light reflected from the ceiling. The girl was tall, with a singularly broad white brow, dark hair, and long lashes that swept her cheek. The face was pale, and when in repose, it could not be readily decided whether she were good-looking or plain, but all hesitation vanished when she raised her great violet eyes, full of color and sparkling with the light of intelligence. The moment that Quarm entered, she dropped the knitting on which she was engaged. A flash of pleasure, a gleam of color, mounted to eyes and cheeks. She half rose with timidity and hesitation, but as Quarm continued in eager conversation with Pepperill, and did not notice her, she sank back into her sitting posture, the color faded from her cheek, her eyes fell, and a quiver of the lips and contraction of the mouth indicated distress and pain. "'How is it possible to turn mud into gold?' asked Pepperill. "'Wait till I have coined my oak, and I will do it.' "'I can understand oaks. The timber is worth something.' and the bark something, and the tops sell for firewood. But mud, mud is mud. Well, it is mud. Let me light my pipe. I can't talk without my backy. Jason put a spill to the fire, seated himself on a stool by the hearth, ignited his pipe, and then, turning his eye about, caught sight of the girl. Hello, little toad, said he. How are you? Then, without waiting for an answer, he returned to the mud. Look here, Pasco. The mud is good for nothing where it is. No, it is a nuisance. It chokes the channel. I had a deal of trouble with the last coal barge. She sank so deep I thought she'd be smothered and never got in. That's just it. You would pay something to have it cleared, dredged right away. I don't know about that. The expense would be great. You need not pay half a crown. It isn't India only whose shining fountains roll down their golden sands. It is Devonshire as well, which pours the river Tyne clear as crystal out of its Dartmoor reservoir, and which is here ready to empty its treasures into my pockets and yours. But we must dispose of Brimp's oak first. I'd like to know how you are going to do anything with mud. What is mud but clay in a state of slobber? Now hearken to me, brother-in-law. I have been where the soil is all clay, clay that would grow nothing but moss and rushes, and was not worth more than five shillings an acre, fit for nothing but for letting young stock run on. That is out Hallsworthy way. Well, a man with the philosopher's stone in his head, Goldsworthy Gurney, he cut a canal from Bood Harbor right through this errant clay land. With what result? The barges travel up from Bood laden with sand. The farmers use the sand over their clay fields, and the desert blossoms as the rose. Land that was worth four shillings went up to two pound ten, and in places near the canal to five pounds. The sand on the seashore is worthless, the clay inland is worthless, but the sand and the clay married breeds monies. Monies, my boy, golden monies. That is reasonable enough, said Pasco Pepperill, but it don't apply here. We are on the richest of red soil that wants no dressing, so full of substance it is in itself. 
Besides, the mud is nothing but our red soil in a state of paste. It is better. It is richer, more nutritious. But you do not see what is to be done with it, because you have not my head and my eyes. I do not propose to do here what was done at Halsworthy, but to invert the operation. What do you mean? Not to carry the sand to the clay, but the mud to the sand. Do you not know Bovey Heathfield? Do you not know Stover Sands? What is there inland but a desert of waste sand hill, an arid flat, that is barren as my hand, bearing nothing but a little scrubby thorn and thistle and bramble, sand, that's not worth half a crown an acre. There is no necessity for us to cut a canal. The canal exists, cut in order that the Hator granite may be conveyed along it to the sea. It has not occurred to the fools that the barges that convey the stone down might come up laden with tine mud instead of returning empty. This mud, I tell you, is not merely rich of itself, but it has a superadded richness from seaweed and broken shells. It is fat with eels and worms. Let this be conveyed up the canal to the sandy waste of Heathfield, and the marriage of clay and sand will be as profitable there as the marriage has been at Halsworthy. I would spread this rich mud over the hungry sand, thick as cream, and the land will laugh and sing. Do you take me now, brother-in-law? Do you believe in the philosopher's stone? He touched his head. Pasco Pepperell had clasped his right knee in his hands. He sat nursing it, musing, looking into the fire. Presently he said, Yes, very fine for the owners of the sandy land, but how about you and me? We must buy up. But where is the money to come from? Brimp's Oak. What? the profit made on this venture? Exactly. Every oak stick is a rung in my ladder. There has been, for hundreds of years, a real forest of oaks, magnificent trees, timber incomparable for hardness. Iron is not harder. Who knows about it save myself? The Exeter Bank knows nothing of the property on which it has advanced money. The agent runs over and takes a hasty glance. He thinks that the trees he sees all up the slopes are thorn bushes, or twisted stumps worth nothing, and when he passes is too eager to get away from the moor to stay and observe. I have felt my way, a small offer and money down, and the whole forest is mine. Then I must fell at once, and it is not, I say, calculable what we shall make out of that oak. When we have raked our money together, we will buy up as much as we can of sandy waste near the canal and proceed at once to plaster it over with tine clay. Pasco, our fortune is made. Jason kept silence for a while, to allow what he had said to sink into the mind of his brother-in-law. Then from the adjoining kitchen came a strongly built, fair woman, very tidy, with light hair and pale blue eyes. She had a decided manner in her movements, and in the way in which she spoke. She had been scouring a pan, she held this pan now in one hand. She strode up to the fireplace between the men and said in a peremptory tone, "'What is this? Speculating again? I tell you what, Jason, you are bent on ruining us. Here is Pasco as wax in your hands. We've already lost half our land, and that is your doing. I do not wish to be sold out of house and home because of your rash ventures. You risk nothing.' It is Pasco and I who have to pay. Go to your scouring and cooking, said Jason. Zara, that is your line. Leave us men to our proper business. I know what comes of your brooding, retorted the woman. You hatch out naught but disaster. If Pasco turned a deaf ear, I would not mind all your tales. But more is the pity, he listens, and listening in his case means yielding and yielding, in plain letters, is loss. Instead of answering his sister, Jason looked once more in the direction of the girl, seated in the bay window. She was absorbed in her thoughts, and seemed not to have been attending to, or to be affected by, the prospects of wealth that had been unfolded by her father. When he had addressed her previously, she had answered, but as he had not attended to her answer, she had relapsed into silence. She was roused by his strident voice, 
as he sang out, There was a frog lived in a well, cock of my daisy kitty alone. There was a frog lived in a well, and a merry mouse lived in a mill, kitty alone and I. Now her pale face turned to him with something of appeal. How is the little worm? asked Quorm. No roses blooming in the cheeks. Wait till I carry you to the moors. There you shall sit and smell the honey breath of the firs, and as the heather covers the hillsides with raspberry cream, the flush of life will come into your face. I'm not so sure but that money might be made out of the spicy air of Dartmoor. Why not condense the scent of the firs bushes and advertise it as a specific in consumption? I won't say that folks wouldn't buy. Why not extract the mountain heather as a cosmetic? It is worth considering. Why not the juice of whortleberry as a dye for the hair? And pounded bog peat for dentifrice? Pasco, my boy, I have ideas. I say, listen to me. This is the way notions come flashing up in my brain. He had forgotten about his daughter, so enkindled was his imagination by his new schemes. Once again, discouraged and depressed, the girl dropped her eyes on her work. The sun shining on the flowing tide filled the bay of the room with rippling light. Walls and ceiling were in a quiver. The glisten was in the glass. It was repeated on the floor. It quivered over her dress and her pale face. It sparkled and wrinkled in her knitting pins. She might have been a mermaid sitting below the water, seen through the restless, undulatory current. Mrs. Pepperrill growled and struck with her fingers the pan she had been cleaning. What is a woman among men but a helpless creature who cannot prevent the evils she sees coming on? Talk of woman as the inferior vessel. It is she has the common sense, and not man. It was not you who brought Coombe Sellers to me, but I brought you to Coombe Sellers, retorted her husband. What is here is mine, the house, the business, the land. You rule in the kitchen, that is your proper place, I rule where I am lord. Pasco spoke with pomposity, drawing his chin back into his neck. When you married me, said Zira, nothing was to be yours only, all was to be yours and mine. I am your wife, not your housekeeper. I shall watch and guard well against waste, against folly. I cannot always save against both, but I can protest, and I will. On hearing the loud tones of Mrs. Pepperell, Kate hastily collected her knitting and ball of worsted and left the room. She was accustomed to passages of arms between Pasco and his wife, two loud and angry voices, but they frightened her and filled her with disgust. She fled the moment the pitch of the voices was raised and their tones became harsh. "'Look there!' exclaimed Zara, before the girl had left the room. "'There is a child for you. Her father returns,' After having been away for a fortnight, she never rises to meet him. She goes on calmly knitting, does not speak a word of welcome, take the smallest notice of him. It was very different with my Wilmot. She would fly to her father. Not that he deserved her love. She would dance about him and kiss him. But she had a heart, and was what a girl should be. As for your Kate, Brother Jason, I don't know what to make of her. What is the matter with Kitty? She's not like other girls. Did you not take notice? She was cold and regardless when you arrived, as if you were a stranger. Never even put aside her knitting, never gave you a word. Zara was perhaps glad of an excuse for not continuing an angry discussion with her husband before her brother. She was hot and could now give forth her heat upon the head of the girl. I don't think I gave her much of a chance, said Jason. You see, I was talking to Pasco about the oaks. Give her a chance, retorted Zara, as if my Wilmot would have waited till her father gave her the chance. It is not for the father to dance after his child, but the child should run to its father. I tell you what I believe, Jason, and nothing will get me out of the belief. You know how Jane Simmons' boy was born without eyelashes, and how last spring we had a lamb without any tail, and that Bessie Penny hasn't got any lobe of ear at all. It's only a hole in the side of her head and Ephraim Tooker has no toenails. I know all that. Very well. I believe, and you'll never shake it out of me, 
That child of yours was born without a heart. End of chapter 2